Our scripture today is from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 13. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also. If I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, to take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire. For the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Elijah is hiding. At first he's on the run, and then he's hiding, actually. And it's odd that he's doing either of those, that he's running or hiding. Seeing as how he's just come from the greatest victory of his life, he ought to be running a victory lap, if anything. If you know your Bible, you know that he's just come from Mount Carmel. And if you don't remember the story of Mount Carmel, I will refresh your memory. And if you have a gumption, too, you can check out. There's a, a story, an animated story, on the uh, on the YouTube page that I did for children here a couple of weeks ago about the story of Elijah at Mount Carmel. You see, the king was Ahab, and Ahab was supposed to keep Israel in line with God and all. But he met this girl named Jezebel, and he thought she was really cool. And he passed her a note in class one day and said, Do you like me? Check a box, yes or no. And so Ahab was wrapped around Jezebel's little finger. The problem was that Jezebel didn't worship God, did not worship Yahweh. She worshipped Baal. So Baal worship increased in Israel, and the worship of Yahweh, God, decreased. In fact, Jezebel had a whole bunch of God's prophets killed, so that Elijah was the only one left. You see, Jezebel was basically the campus crusade for Baal director. Elijah was God's best prophet, so he went to Ahab. Elijah told Ahab to summon all of the prophets of Baal and get all of Israel to meet 
him and the prophets of Baal and because he had a challenge. Elijah said, we will see which God is the real God, which one is really God, Baal or the Lord. Each of us is going to prepare a sacrifice and put it on an altar, and we will not light it. But whosoever God lights the fire is the one true God. That was the challenge. And the prophets of Baal agreed to it. It was 450 of them versus one measly prophet of, of Yahweh, this guy Elijah. So they started the next morning. He, Elijah allowed the prophets of Baal to go first. So they called upon Baal for hours and hours. They pleaded and they bleated for Baal, cut themselves to impress him, and they chanted and ranted and danced and pranced for Baal and nothing. Baal didn't answer them. So after hours of doing this, Elijah began to mock them. He doesn't hear you. I thought you said he was a real God. Are you sure he can hear you? Maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's having a tough time in the bathroom. Now, I'm not making that up. That's actually in the Hebrew. So after a while, after all of these prophets began to get a little woozy because they were losing blood, Elijah said, sit down, boys. It's my turn. So Elijah took over. And it was his turn. And not only did Elijah build an altar and cut up an ox and put it on the altar, he dug a trench around his altar and he told the helpers there, get a bunch of barrels and fill them up with water and drench the altar. And they did. And he said, well, okay, okay, do it again. And they did. He said, okay, do it one more, one more time. And they did it so much that the, the ox carcass and the altar was all drenched. And they had so much water on it that even the trench that he had dug around the altar was completely filled with water. And then Elijah called out. He lifted his face to the heavens and he, and he prayed. He said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. And that I've done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. And then it happened. Fire shot down from heaven. Shaboom! And it not only lit the fire underneath the offering, but it burned everything up. The, the, the offering, the, the carved up oxen was gone. It burned everything else up too. It, it burned up the sacrifice. It burned up the altar. It burned up the wood and the stone that was made into the altar. It even burned up the dust underneath the altar. It even evaporated and licked up the water in the trench around the altar. It was a huge victory. All of Israel said, Yay! Yahweh is truly God. And all the prophets of Baal said, Uh-oh, we need to run. And they did, and Israel ran them down and took them down to the Wadi Kishon. <clears throat> and Elijah told them, uh, kill them. And they did. They killed them there, all 450 of them. Again, I'm not making that up. It's in the book. So it's a tremendous victory, right? Yes, it is. Except there's only one problem. Jezebel didn't like it. Jezebel, the, the lady who really liked Baal all, all that much. She said, uh, may the gods do to me what you did to them if I don't do the same to you by this time tomorrow. And Elijah said, oh, okay. And that's when he started running. He becomes afraid for his life. And so he runs and he hides. Now you might think that Elijah, being a prophet of God, and the fact that God just showed up in a huge way, would keep him from being scared. But let's be real, he's a human. And Jezebel has immense power. And we know that God doesn't always show up all the time, every time you say, God, please show up. So Elijah was on the run. And after this little thing at the broom tree, where he feels, God, just go ahead and kill me now, Elijah goes to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God, and he finds a cave. 
and he crawls into this dark cave and he waits on God to speak. Elijah really needs to hear a word from God. And so he waits in the dark in this cave. So only God can find him. And you know what? I think we've all been there. We've all been in a place where we want to hear from God. That's why we pray. That's why we read the Bible. And I think right now that's, I think we all are there. We're all in our cave. Now maybe we didn't want to crawl into our cave and shut the door, but we've all had to. The coronavirus made it necessary. This morning, we're not all in the church. We're all at home in our cave with the door closed. We are all isolated, peering out from our caves to get a look at what's going on in the world. And we're hoping that God is going to show up, that God's going to speak to us and say something, that God's going to save us from this thing. I think we're all right there. We want to hear from God, and we want to hear from God soon. Sooner would be better than later, God. I remember at a, a former church, we held a Bible study at Hazel's house. Hazel was one of those refreshing people, and she had a gift where she said exactly what was on her mind every time. And we were talking about listening for God, about wanting to hear from God at this particular Bible study. And I'll never forget, she said, you know, I keep asking God to speak to me, but all I ever hear is you people. <laughs> she didn't realize it, but she made a very real connection to the truth. Sometimes God does speak to us and we don't hear because we aren't listening for the right thing. Sometimes we're listening for what we think will be God's voice but it comes in a different way, and we miss it. I remember as a, as a kid in my room at night, lying there awake and trying to hear God's voice. I so desperately wanted to hear God speak to me. I could hear the blood in my ears, but I couldn't hear God. We all want to hear God's voice. And when Elijah is standing there at the mouth of his cave, we are right there with him. Give us words, God. That's what we want. So Elijah is there in the cave doing what we do, waiting to hear from God. A loud wind comes crashing through. But God is not in the wind. And then an earthquake shows up. But God is not in the earthquake either. Then there is a great fire, but God does not speak to him through the fire either. All of them are apparently useless. Elijah was expecting God to show up in a big way, but he is denied. Elijah wanted God to be simple. But God is a mystery. God is both within our grasp and at the same time far beyond our grasp slipping through our fingers because we cannot contain God. God is very much right with us, but very much far beyond us. God is very much like the mystery of the darkness in a cave. Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford knew the cave. Spafford and his wife, Anna, were pretty well known in 1860s Chicago. Some of you may know his story. Uh, others of you may not, so if you if you already know his story, just bear with me while I tell those who don't. The Spaffords were prominent supporters and close friends of D.L. Moody in Chicago in the 19th century. D.L. Moody was a famous preacher. And in 1870, things started to go wrong for the Spaffords. The Spaffords' only son was killed by scarlet fever at the age of four in 1870. And a year later, the fire of Chicago struck on October 8th, and 
swept through the city and destroyed almost everything that Horatio Spafford owned. Two years later, in 1873, Spafford decided his family should take a holiday somewhere in Europe and chose England, knowing that his friend D.L. Moody would be preaching there in the fall. Now, he was delayed because of business that he had to take care of, so he sent his family ahead on a ship. His family was his wife and their four daughters. Annie, age 11, Margaret Lee, 9, Elizabeth, 5, and two-year-old Tanetta. On November 22, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic on the steamship Ville du Havre, their ship was struck by an iron sailing vessel and 226 people lost their lives, including all four of Spafford's daughters. Anna Spafford survived the tragedy. Upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to Spafford bearing the awful words, Saved alone. You know the cave. I know for a fact, simply because we've had so many people in our church, that many of you have dealt with depression, addiction, suicidal thoughts, burnout, stress, anxiety, grief. You want God to be there, to rescue from the cave, to pull you out. Some of you might have some part of your past that is painful. Abuse, addiction, some type of painful event. Every person knows what it feels like to be somewhere close to where Elijah was. And if you don't, well, congratulations. You're very young. You just haven't lived long enough yet. You'll get there. You want to hear from God because you need to hear from God. You know the cave. Perhaps you know what it's like to need to hear from God from another standpoint. Maybe you teach Sunday school, or vacation Bible school, or you're a lay speaker, or you lead a Bible study or something. You know what it's like to need to have a word from God to give to your class, because it's marked on your calendar, or it's Sunday, and Sunday comes every two and, a half two and a half days, it seems. And you want to hear from God because you do not want to face your class without having anything to say. And you've got to have a word from God. Preachers know the cave. Every week it's the same. We dwell in the cave, wrestling with the biblical text until it blesses us, and we step into the pulpit, and we look out at the entire congregation, at all of you, and you're all staring back at us from the mouth of all of your caves. You brought your cave with you to church. Everyone brings their caves with them. Just like you are in your cave right now at home, peering out over the internet, watching this on the internet, hoping it might be safe enough to venture outside soon. I want to hear from God because I see people living in caves. We all want to hear from God because we're all stuck in our own little cave of whatever. Your cave, what is your cave made of? What puts you in your cave? Is it just the virus? Or were you in your cave long before the virus hit? Maybe you're looking for some answers in the middle of a great life storm. People who have trouble finding a job know the cave. People trying to cope with family dysfunction in relationship, they know the cave. People who are mourning the death of a loved one know the cave. People facing their own death know the cave. In the darkness of the cave, we cry out, God, do you care? Do you feel my pain, my frustration? Do you feel my sorrow and my doubt? Are you there, God? It's me, Elijah. God did not leave Elijah disappointed. God comes to him in the sound of sheer silence. And that changes everything. One of the best preaching professors I've ever known is named Dr. Eugene Lowry. And he tells about having an older brother named Ralph. 
and he says that when his parents used to go away for a while, he and Ralph would immediately head down to the basement, and Ralph, being the older brother, would always beat him to the basement, and as soon as he got into the basement, Ralph turned out the lights every time. And at that moment, because Eugene would get scared, Ralph was everywhere in the dark. Eugene could feel him there in front of him and behind him and to either side. Ralph, is that you? He'd take one step and just know he was going to run into Ralph. Between him and the light switch, somewhere, everywhere, was Ralph. The cave is a very important place for us to be, I think. It's a very important place for us to admit that we are, I think. It's only in the cave, in that incredibly troubling time, that we can discover where God is during those incredibly troubling times. That God is right there with us. You see, God does not cater to our expectations. Listen to what God says to Elijah. Listen to his words. Did you catch what God said to Elijah? He said it to him twice. What are you doing here, Elijah? This is perhaps one of the greatest truths of all Scripture within God's question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Not there. Not what are you doing there, Elijah. Not what are you doing down there. What are you doing over there, Elijah? But what are you doing here, Elijah? God has been there all along. It's God's darkness. It's God's silence. God never leaves us. It's God's cave the whole time. It's God's cave. It's as if God has come up to Elijah while Elijah's looking out of the cave, looking at all, all, all of these loud things that are going on, the fire and the earthquake and the wind, and he's looking for God everywhere. God quietly comes up behind him and over his shoulder whispers into his ear, What are you doing here, Elijah? It gives me chills. You see, for us to hear God, we got to listen. And we think it's some kind of formula. Okay, Elijah was listening for God, and he wasn't in the loud things, so we got to listen to God in the small things, right? Okay, so God is not coming to big things, but in the small things. And so we try to listen for God in the silence. Because we're so used to Christianity, or churchianity, rather. We're so used to churchianity trying to sell us things as a program that we, we gear ourselves to listen for God in the silence and nowhere else that we just kind of, we bear down and we try real hard to hear God in the silence. We try and listen for God's voice in the silence, eluding us for God, and then, boom! God comes back to us in the loud and the obvious. God doesn't follow any type of procedure or program or formula. God is God. And God will come to us as God wishes to come to us. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that this is an episode in the life of Elijah that is due to a brief lapse into naivete by Elijah. This is not some story of a young Elijah before he, quote, had it all together. We often think that times of mystery and the times that we live in a cave are only for those young in the faith, those who are weak. And we don't want to give the picture that we might be weak. I've been a Christian for 2011 years, and I remember that when I was immature and young in the faith, I had times like that. <laughs> no. <clears throat> That's incorrect. This is Elijah. This is the prophet who was taken to heaven in a golden chariot and never knew death because he was so close to God. This was at the end of his ministry, not the beginning. In fact, one of the next things that God is going to tell Elijah is that he is to go anoint Elisha as his replacement. And if you or I think that we can't possibly have times like those in the cave, it's because we're lying to ourselves and we're not nearly as spiritually mature as we think we are. 
if it can happen to Elijah, it can happen to any of us at any time. The only way to properly deal with the cave is to be honest about where we are. We already said that Horatio Spafford knew the cave, and we know he did. And the reason that some of you know his name, or some of you may have recognized the name but not been able to place it, is that because he is the man who wrote the very famous and very loved hymn, It Is Well. And on his journey across the Atlantic to meet his wife, he went out to the deck of the ship when he reached the approximate point in the North Atlantic where his daughters died. And it was there on the deck of the ship that he wrote the hymn, It Is Well. In fact, the tune name of that hymn, and if you have a hymnal anywhere in your home, you can look it up down at the bottom of the page. The tune name of that hymn, It Is Well, is the Ville du Havre, which is the name of the ship which sank with his daughters on it. Spafford knew that God was in the darkness and the silence with him. Now, I think that's a profound testimony. Because I can't imagine myself being in a place where I'm nearly okay with that. But it didn't happen to me. I can't imagine saying to God, it's well with my soul. But that's not my cave. And I thank God for that. Horatio Spafford was not alone in his cave. And that's why he was able to make it through. Eugene Lowry wasn't alone in his cave, he said. And you and I aren't alone in our caves. And as all of us are in our caves, we are not alone. Sometimes we can't see or hear God, but if we wait, we will. When we feel God has not shown up, that's a momentary and temporary situation in us, not in God, in us. This is a complex life. It's not easy. Our temporary existences are full of pain, fear, stress, and all that bad stuff. And God is there. God is also there for all the joy, love, peace, and hope we have. But when we are in the middle of our caves, feeling the darkness and the fear and the isolation and the loneliness, it is most important to know that God is there. Check that. God is here. God is always with us. Sometimes we don't readily see God through the haze of the darkness, but God is always here, right here with you, with me. Sometimes it's very, very much not evident to us, but God is here. It's God's cave. It's God's darkness. God is a complex mystery, but a mystery who loves us. Too many folks will tell you just to ignore it and your doubt will go away. No, no, no. That's too simple. Don't ignore your doubt, because when you're honest about your doubt, God can work in you to relieve your doubt, to meet you where you are. If you have doubts and you're honest about them, God can give you the answers that you need. But if you never are honest about your doubts, you can never find the answers you need, and those problems can never be solved. Which would you rather have? So be honest about them. You see, God is a wonderful mystery. We know that our God is omnipotent, omniscient, but we aren't over there where God is, but God is over here where we are, and everything seems so simple where God is. On the other side, it seems simple to us where God is in eternity, but where we are, it seems so complicated. We want to get there where God is, but we aren't able to on our own, and so God is here with us also. You know, Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, I wouldn't give a fig for all the simplicity on this side of complexity. But I would give the whole world for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Do you know what lies in between the two simplicities? A cave. And it's God's cave. I know this is a hard time for everybody, but don't be afraid. It's God's cave. God's going to get us through it. And we will get to the other side. This is normally the time when I give an invitation to respond to God. And I think, I, I really do believe, God deserves our response today, because just like God did with Elijah, I believe God in our caves has come up to us today and whispered to us over our shoulders, What are you doing here?